Hello, I'm the Awesome Tutor, and we are back again with Egypt, looking at the last part of this uh, topic in the specification, the conquest of Sudan. Now, this is probably the last empire video I'm going to make, so good luck everyone on the exam tomorrow. Let's get through this. So what actually happened in the campaign to conquer Sudan? Well, initially there was very slow progress. The British were very cautious in their initial aims. They only made it halfway uh, to Khartoum at Dongla in 1896. And so they were trying to maintain their supply lines at all times. It wasn't really um, something of high priority to get rid of the Mahdi and conquer Sudan. Now this all changed with the Battle of Ferkeh, I don't know how to say it, uh, in June 1896. Because what this did is it was the first actual intense skirmish between the Mahdists and the British forces. And that led to the acceleration of the campaign. So, the reason why the British so easily defeated the Mahdists was because they had the newest tech. They had light gorge railways for supplies, they had gunboats, and they had the Maxim gun, the first ever automated machine gun. So, at the Battle of Omdurman on the 2nd of September 1898, pretty much the decisive British victory against the Mahdists, they slaughtered 10,000 of them, but only 47 British soldiers died. So clearly, a decisive victory. Now, what was also significant was the brutality of Kitchener's actions. And what you have to understand is Kitchener's motivation behind this. He was mainly brutal with the Mahdist forces because of his veneration of Gordon, for example, who was killed uh, at the siege of Khartoum in 1885, remember? When the Mahdists um, broke through the fortifications and wiped out the entire garrison. And that failed relief expedition, which arrived two days late, Kitchener was part of that relief expedition. So that all contributed towards his brutal actions in this campaign. Now, examples of this is after the victory, Kitchener ordered the Mahdi's head to be decapitated from his dead corpse, and he also did not reissue the order that the wounded be spared. In the Battle of Atbara, uh, before the Battle of Omdurman, he issued an order telling his soldiers to spare the wounded, but in the Battle of Omdurman, he did not do this. What Kitchener also did is he ordered the tomb of the Mahdi to be opened up to prevent pilgrimage. Okay? Now, the Fashoda incident, I don't really think it's that important, but I'm gonna give you a brief explanation of what it is anyway. Okay, so after the Omdurman victory, uh, Kitchener's forces continued marching down the Nile, and what happened was they met up, or they intersected with um, Marchand's force, the French forces, who are crossing Africa to join their two colonies on the opposite sides of the continent. And so what you had in that incident was a disagreement or conflict with both sides claiming that the area and the Upper Nile were under their sphere of influence. Thankfully, there was no actual physical confrontation. The matter was referred back to London and Paris to sort the, for, for the politicians to sort out. And this actually shows a stark contrast with Kitchener's brutality in the Battle of Omdurman. So clearly he had some direct and clear motivation that drove his brutality in Omdurman. And most historians suggest that it is his veneration uh, for Gordon. Now, what is significant about the Fashoda incident is its outcome. Okay, so after the matter was referred, on the 3rd of November, 1898, the French actually ceded the area to the British. So, whilst the Omdurman victory effectively established de facto British control over the whole of the Nile Valley, it was the Fashoda incident 
that ensured perhaps de jure control, especially in terms of keeping the French out and securing hegemony in the area. Now, I have a hunch, I may be wrong, that a question on Egypt will come up in this exam, and I think it's going to be on Sudan, specifically the reasons for the conquest of Sudan. So that's why I'm going through this video. So you have strategic reasons, like the importance of the Nile Valley, you have Gordon's mission and the aftermath of that, and you have pan-Islamic nationalism with the threat of the Mahdists. So, strategic reasons. Now, the Nile Valley is so vital to British trade, and the source of the Nile is located in Sudan. So, what the British want to do is they want to secure the source of the Nile so they can secure their trade interests in Africa. And also, of course, to protect Egypt, because Sudan will act as a good buffer zone for Egypt, and will also ensure that there are no areas surrounding Egypt which could pose a potential threat. Now, another strategic reason, obviously, is to kick out the French. Okay? Now, the French also had influence in the area. Remember, they had the majority of the Suez Canal shares, so they had influence in Egypt, but they also had influence in the other parts of the Nile Valley. In 1887, something significant happened. Lord Salisbury, the Prime Minister at the time, reached an agreement with the Ottoman Sultan that was very favourable to British interests in the Nile Valley. But the French were not happy about it, so what they did is they threatened the Sultan with the invasion of Syria. And so what this did is it compelled Lord Salisbury to remain in Egypt and to counter any possible threats to Egypt, like those in Sudan, in order to counter French influence, okay? So, what these 1887 threats did is it convinced Parliament that France still remained a large threat to British interests in the Nile Valley. Now, you also had, in 1890, the British declared that the entire of the Nile Valley was under their sphere of influence, they had diplomatic negotiations with other countries to ensure this, but they were not successful with France. They refused. They said, no, 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 no. So again, the strategic threat of France remained. You also had French ambitions. Now, what the French ultimately wanted to do is they wanted to connect their uh, colonies in Western Africa with their port in Djibouti. What that would do is it would go right through the Nile and obviously threatening British interests in the Nile Valley. So again, France, big strategic threat. So a reason that the British went into Sudan was to once and for all kick the French out and establish their sole dominance in the Nile Valley. Now, Gordon's mission, I went over what happened in Gordon's mission in my previous video, but what's more significant here in terms of the reasons why the British went into Sudan was the aftermath of Gordon's mission, okay? The public response was huge. There was a large outrage in the public against what the Mahdi had done to Gordon. There was grief, there was vengeance, there was even a national day of mourning. And in fact, during this memorial service, Kitchener was in tears. So again, perhaps another reason to explain why Kitchener was so brutal with the Mahdist forces in Omdurman. There are also multiple books, paintings and textbooks which depicted Gordon's last moments in the siege of Khartoum, glorifying him in the eyes of the public. This is one of those paintings, you also had famous poets like Alfred Lord Tennyson writing poems about Gordon. This is uh, the poem he wrote. You can read it in your own time. I'm going to continue. Now, what was also significant was the government's response, or the effect on Parliament, because Prime Minister Gladstone's party was divided on this issue. It was, it was facing 
huge public pressure and Gladstone resigned in 1885, replaced by Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, a more conservative figure. And perhaps what you could say, this is quite a stretch though, is that Lord Salisbury, with his more conservative ideology, would be more willing to invade in order to protect British strategic interests. Now, you also had the Queen, which was absolutely devastated and quite frustrated with this incident. Okay, she even sent an uncoded telegram rebuking Gordon for his inaction or inability to prevent the tragedy that was Gordon's death. And the fact that it was uncoded, again, shows that this was intended for public consumption and helps to highlight the significance of the aftermath of Gordon's mission in driving public opinion. Now, pan-Islamic nationalism, specifically the Mahdist forces. The Mahdists were becoming an increasingly bigger threat, and this can be seen in March 1896 in the Battle of Adwa, where they completely destroyed the Italian forces in the area, indicating that not only were their influence spreading, because this was in Ethiopia, but also it indicated their growing strength. And in fact, this was one of the contributing uh, short-term triggers towards the acceleration of the campaign and the conquest of Sudan, because in June 1896, if you remember from the previous slides, the Battle of Farke took place, and that was the turning point in increasing the drive towards actually conquering the Sudan. Now, you also had the risk of the Mahdists spreading their influence into Egypt, okay? And obviously, they did not want, the British did not want this pan-Islamic nationalism to merge with Egyptian nationalism, which was under the surface in Egypt and was starting to bubble. Because if you remember, Sir Evelyn Baring's reforms kind of frustrated Egyptian society at all classes and all levels. We've gone through the analysis of how these factors could act as causes to the British invasion of Sudan. Let's evaluate these factors now. In terms of the strategic interests, well, what strategic value did the Sudan hold? If you remember Gordon's mission, when he was dispatched to Sudan, he was, dis he was dispatched there to evacuate the area, not to instigate an invasion showing how perhaps Sudan was not really that important to the British strategically. Now, the French, the issue of the French, the French already had a strong presence in the Nile Valley since 1869 when the Suez Canal was built. And it was built by a French businessman, if you remember. Um, I think his name was Ferdinand de Lesseps. And they also had the majority of the shares in the Suez Canal. Okay? The French had an influence in the Nile Valley for quite some time. If you remember the dual control that they established with the British in 1878, they also had shared financial control in the area alongside the British. And in the bombardment of Alexandria when the British invaded Egypt, France was part of that invasion force before, of course, it withdrew at the last minute. So you can hardly say that France's presence in the area was threatening enough to the British to convince them to invade the Sudan and establish their control. Now, Gordon's mission had a huge time lag. When was Gordon's mission? When was the aftermath? 1885 and post-1885. When did the British actually conquer the Sudan? In 1898. That is 13 years later. So perhaps you could say that the aftermath of Gordon's mission was more symbolic than an actual reason for intervention. Okay? Now, when Gladstone's cabinet was divided on this issue, 
they were prepared to ride out the public disapprobation that was occurring as a result of Gordon's death. And clearly, they wrote it out. Thirteen years. Now, why was Gordon dispatched to the Sudan in the first place? As I said, he was dispatched to evacuate the area. And that also indicates that the invasion was not really in the British interest. Pan-Islamic nationalism, well, the Mahdi died in 1885 of typhus. So, the Mahdist's figurehead that was whipping up revolutionary fervor died a long time before the actual conquering of Sudan. So, the threat was not as big as it was made out to seem. And also, the pan-Islamic nationalism in the Sudan was well contained. Well contained for how long? Well, the rise of the Mahdi was in 1881, so it was contained for 17 years before the British actually invaded Sudan. So perhaps it was more of a question of the Sudan was too important to leave to chance, to leave to the possibility or risk that this pan-Islamic nationalism was going to spread specifically into Egypt and start to actually pose a real threat. So this prompted a sort of preemptive incursion. But the threat was overstated. Now, relative significance. If you want to get into those higher marks, you need to synthesize and cross-compare these factors, especially if the question says something like, was it uh, British strategic interests that was the main reason why they invaded Sudan? For questions like that, you need to rank the factors. And so, let's use this analytical and evaluative language to do that. So you could say that the British invasion of Sudan arose from strategic interest. This was the underlying factor. The conquering of Sudan was rooted in British strategic interests. The risk, the possible risk that nationalism posed was a threat to what? To British strategic interests in the area. So although nationalism could be considered as a sort of a trigger-like factor, it was strategic interests that were actually the main priority for the British. That was why they went into Sudan to defend their strategic interests, which was under threat by nationalism. Conversely, you could argue that it was pan-Islamic nationalism that was the trigger for the British invasion of Sudan and therefore was the most important reason why strategic interests was of secondary importance. This especially because of the Battle of Adwa in 1896, which was sort of the turning point, the necessary prelude or prerequisite to the acceleration of the campaign. So you could say that this was the direct cause of the conquest of Sudan. This is what provoked the British into military engagement. Now, going back to the strategic argument, as I said, because nationalism was a threat to strategic interests, just as the French were a threat to strategic interests, you could say that preventing the spread of nationalism was a subsidiary of British strategic interests in the area. Now, Gordon's mission, we said it was mostly symbolic rather than an actual cause. It did escalate a lot of public opinion, which did have a lot of pressure on the government, but not enough to actually lead to direct action, at least not immediately. So, what was essential about the Sudan to the British? It was not the strategic value that the Sudan held, it was the strategic value that Egypt held, and the Suez Canal held, and the Nile Valley held, and the Sudan was simply a possible threat to that strategic interest which the British were unwilling to tolerate. However, they tolerated it for quite a long period of time, and it was really the 
Battle of Adwa, which was the turning point that escalated strategic concerns to the point where military engagement was considered necessary. So perhaps nationalism is more important. But does it matter which one you argue is the most important factor? No, it does not. What matters is whether you can justify it or not, and how well you can justify it. This has been The Awesome Tutor. Bye.